Welcome to Benjamin Breton. Welcome to the Berlach Institute. Uh, allow me to just introduce a bit the lecture program and the Solomon Frost to the head of the public program here at the Berlach. We'll introduce Benjamin in a minute. Uh, what I would like to say, just a couple of words in a way in which uh, this year at the Berlach in a formats of format of the public lectures, we'll be dwelling under the umbrella what Solomon called, how did you call it? Yeah, shift, all the delete. I uh, asked him to call it reset, but he thinks uh, this <laughs> second title uh, is much more computational, perhaps. <laughs> Nevertheless, what we wanted to really question, do we live really in a time of deleting certain paradigms or premises, and are we entering a radically new shifts and paradigms. And uh, then I asked Solomon, OK, that's perhaps a valid question, but who are the people and who are the kind of figures which can address those issues? And uh, that's why I'm very happy that we have Benjamin Bratton here, uh, because once one look into his interest, which is sociology, media, design, theories, and in a, his uh, capacity of associate professor of visual arts at the University of California, and the director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at the California Institute of Telecommunication and Information, is somebody who I believe would uh, contribute greatly to the debate here at the Berlach and will answer your questions after his, his lecture. Clearly, this lecture might be very congruent or, or to the interest of our computational studio run by Philippe Morel, the studio which tries, I think, to examine the consequences of the global computational cloud, if you wish, and the ways in which uh, uh, we as architects, planners, and urban thinkers might relate to it. I often uh, look at at thinkers, perhaps like Philip or Benjamin, as as a as a kind of early Christian still being in the catacombs of city of Rome, and telling us, "Look, guys, wake up! Here is a new, <coughs> not religion, but the the new world which we have to address seriously." with intelligence and with vigor and with the way in which we have to relate to it, shall I say, constructively. And if we, if we look that perhaps tomorrow two and a half million British workers will be on the streets of London questioning the very situation in which they live, and all others in Athens almost do not question that, anymore in a sort of despair, that it's not only then a kind of political or geopolitical, which is the interest of Benjamin, situation in which we live today, which needs answers. So Solomon, could you please come to introduce the speaker? I would only ask you to switch off your global devices. Um, so maybe is, um, this evening's lecture by Benjamin Breton is the second in our year-long um, series entitled Shift, Alt, Delete. Um, in the subtitle, I did include the word reset, resetting a design agenda, um, which brings together, or will bring together over the next six months, more than two dozen architects, designers, artists, curators, and theorists to think about the aesthetic, cultural, economic, technological, and sociopolitical determinants that will potentially define the future of our designed environment. Tonight's talk, titled Deep Address, The Cloud, The Stack, is organized in conjunction with our second year postgraduate research studio, titled Computation in Space in the Last Domestic Landscape, led by Philippe Morel. It's a pleasure uh, to welcome Benjamin H. Branton, a sociological media and uh, design theorist, to the Berlaga. 
He is an associate professor of visual arts at the University of California, San Diego, and director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, one of the world's premier applied research institutions in the application of super computing and large scale data visualization. His work uh, sits at the intersections of contemporary and social political theory, computational media and infrastructure, and architectural and urban design problems and methodologies. Current research interests include the philosophical problematics of interfaciality, digital urbanism and media architecture, contemporary continental philosophy and aesthetic theory, the history and future of political geography, models of computational ecological governance, organizational theory, and speculative interaction interface and systems design. He has lectured widely and is the author of many articles and book chapters in both popular and academic publications, and is a frequent visitor uh, and advisor and consultant to public and private organizations. He's the former director of Advanced Strategies Group at Yahoo in Sunnyvale and Burbank, California, and former director of Information Architecture at Razorfish in Los Angeles and New York. Um, Benjamin, welcome to the Berlaga, and um, we also invite you tomorrow night uh, when we hand over the lecture to Hank Olving, Deputy Director um, General for Spatial Planning and Director for National Spatial Planning at the Netherlands Ministry for Infrastructure and the Environment. He'll discuss how he's resetting a political agenda for design in the Netherlands. Uh, thank you, Benjamin. I think so. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Solomon and, and, and Philippe. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be here in Rotterdam uh, and, at the, and at the Berlaga. Uh, I think Shift Alt Delete's a better title, too, actually. To sort of th better than asterisk backslash base bar or any other versions of that as well. I hope to live up, and I hope to live up to the implications of all three. Um, let me sort of quickly, uh, this, is, uh, what, this is all new material that I'm going to be presenting here. Something very recently written, some very, very new projects, so hopefully it'll all hang together in a way, that, uh, in a way that's provocative and that we can um, you know, have a, a good discussion afterwards, which is really always the most interesting and important point, of, of course. So let me just quickly just sort of start with some of these particulars. As I said, I'm the director of the Center for Design and Geopolitics at um, California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, which is a, uh, an interesting institute in that it brings together people from computer science, electrical engineering, uh, nano engineering, visual arts, architecture, uh, to work on a range of interdisciplinary projects. Then Center for Design and Geopolitics is in many ways the institute's think tank. We're interested in not so much the invention of the new, new technologies and new machines, but thinking about what, the, what future social, cultural, economic future they portend for us and us for them. <coughs> so let me jump in. In the age of planetary scale computation, what is the future of sovereign geography? As it is conditioned by globalization, localization, and intermediate zonal regionalisms, by spaces absorbed by networks and networks absorbed by citadels, will some other unknown political geography come to enact and enforce the necessary partitions and brackets, border, wall, law, identity, that would program the world according to its alternative plan and plan it according to its program? For the citizen, subject, user, agent of that future, how can sovereignty itself be redesigned as the organization of another cosmopolitanism, another geography, and another world that is not only possible, but in its own way, inevitable? So these questions then are posed in anticipation of an opening to come, another Copernican rotation of the spatial order that would emerge both in resemblance and against the image of planetary scale computation as we currently understand it. We may not have to wait very long. Geographies that were comfortable and doxic are now transient and alien, inhabited weirdly. Lines are rewritten, dashed, curved, erased, automated, becoming frame and then topography. 
the opposition of thonic and geometric territorialization is collapsed into computation. The algorithmic is accounted for as a means of continental divide. Interfaces multiply into networks, which multiply into territories, which multiply into geoscapes, territories comprised of territories, made and so entered into, not entered into and so made. The embedded is mobilized and the liquid is tethered down into shelter, infrastructure. Jurisdictional territories are multiplied from flat planes into towered interwoven stacks. The opaque is transcribed and the transparent is theatricalized, staged, artificialized. The enclave, the diaspora, the satellite, and expatriate allegiances are formalized. Futurist and medievalist scenarios both confiscate supercomputational utopias one from another. The incompletable comprehensiveness of Earth's archives are folded back upon themselves as a promiscuous ambient cosmopolitics. The stack is assembled as the blur infrastructure of a world composed, our pharmacon, both remedy and poison, and so on. But even as strange geographies corrugate, fracture, and smear worldly scale and tempo, the ground isn't somehow evaporated into virtual information flux, but quite to the contrary, we are brought to the end of the end of non-place, to a point where place can be and must be reestablished anew as an accountable habitat in the renewed image of these very same deformations. That establishment is neither a universal irredentism, a natural log regrounding in organic systems, nor universal secessionism, nor an accelerationist escape. It is a designation, a composition, a design aesthetics, and a projective ethics of pan-infrastructure, deployed for a geopolitical ontology that cannot possibly untangle material from information, materialism from informationalism, earth from sky. The line on the earth is a vector in the sky. Now, for a consideration of a no, the nomos of the cloud, which is a bit key term I want to discuss a bit, the nomos of planetary computation as the substrate of a geopolitical order. So then what is a nomos? I employ the concept from Carl Schmitt's 1950 work, The Nomos of the Earth in the International Law of Jus Publicum Europeum in which the notorious German legal theorist de develops a sweeping topological history of how political orders, particularly Greeks, Romans, uh, the, Greek, the Greek and Roman empires, and then the British and German empires, divided and partitioned the geometry of territory into particular forms of political geography, from which defining logics of sovereignty were then derived. Schmidt defined nomos thusly. The Greek word for the first measure of all subsequent measures, for the first land appropriation understood as the first partite and classification of space, for the primeval division and distribution. This is nomos. So it is both a structural logic and a primordial first act of territorial inscription in accordance with that logic a making of a territorial order through the execution of a territorial claim and the physical occupation which precedes it. From this then, nomos becomes a master architecture of the space of the geopolitical, an organizing structure of the world order slash earth order, a generative partition of the domains of space according to which subdivisions of sovereignty are constituted and enforced. First from arbitrary territorial capture, then to technique of delineation, then to geopolitical order because derived from Earth, and then to the language of cosmogram or world map and back again. Frederick Jameson offers another structural variation on Schmidt's definition. He writes, the concept of the nomos is a periodizing and structural category whose family likeness, besides one to the Marxian mode of production, 
might also include one of Foucault's historical epistems then inevitably brings with it the problem of the break, not particularly solved by the notion of transition. In Schmidt, however, the fact of the break is an energizing one. First, because it suggests that each break, the historical designation of a given nomos, will call for historically and historically original production of a new legal superstructure, or novum. This call then lays in place the notion of an active moment of constitutive power of the kind theorized in our, our time by Antonio Negri and in turn qualifies the seeming pessimism of the open end of the work." Unquote. That's Jameson. Schmidt's work lamented the end of a European order and viewed with suspicion the rise of an American era. Uh, 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 and, that w and of, a, of a USA that was ultimately incapable or that would even be desirable for Schmidt who served the Nazis. His history of that European nomos is built upon the encounter with the new world, of the free soil that it presented to the European jurisdictional imagination, that is the discovery and accounting for the Americas. The unpartitioned Americas were one of the breaks that Jameson speaks of. And Schmidt demonstrates how this recognition of an unwritten territorial outside to Europe motivated its competing common laws and juridical traditions to formalize into homologous spatial geography, which, as for the Treaty of Westphalia, subdivided <coughs> loops of land but not of sea, and largely ignored air and the z-axis altogether in favor of a master Archimedean point from which the dominant cosmogram of the Mercator projection could be made. I argue that the emergence of planetary scale computation, as yet in its larval stage, represents a similar break and a similar challenge to the geopolitical geogra ge ge geographical order. Jameson again. Yet the prophecy of an air power returned to total war, with the friend-foe pairing replaced by self and other, human and subhuman, is only partially correct. For it is no longer a question of air as an element, but one of cyberspace. Information is the new element that reproblematizes re the spatial." Unquote. For Giorgio Agamben, quite fam who quite famously defines, quote, the nomos of the modern as the camp, a spatial expression of integral exception that locates the sovereign as he who can suspend the juridical order by fiat. But the nomos of the cloud, which both is and is not modern, the model of the spatial exception is the enclave the discontiguous sovereign body that interpenetrates and interweaves a thickened landscape of territorial claims. That thickened landscape, that dense verticalization of the geometry of political geography is, I argue, less an accumulation of absorbable remainders of geopolitical parts, parts maudites than the architecture of another nomos called the stack. The stack is that vast software and hardware formation, a proto megastructure of both bits and atoms, literally circumscribing the planet, which, as said, not only perforates and distorts Westphalian models of the state territory, it produces new, new territories in its own image clouds, networks, zones, social graphs, ecologies, megacities, formal and informal violences, weird theologies, one, each superimposed one on top of the other. Schmidt defined nomos again as the organization of the, or, the appropriation of land, a particular mode for the appropriation of land, and a particular mode for the process of warfare. Isn't, this, isn't the disruptive qualities 
of contemporary geopolitics taken in aggregate, precisely that they alter both of these definitions beyond a certain tipping point of recognition. The contemporary geopolitics of the moment and the confused commentaries with which we muddle through are knotted by the emergence and violences of the stack. The employment of social media in the Arab Spring outlining an anterior stratum of crowds and power, or how Wikipedia formalizes taxonomic consensus from a heteroglossia of interests, and WikiLeaks inverts the ocular and occult body of the state, or how Google cloud services both circumvent and circumscribes state authority in China, and so on and so on. Events and pseudo-events both are plentiful. And it's hard to know which signal a new situation and which are trivial. The Google standoff between Nicar Costa Rica and Nicaragua, where, as you recall, Google Earth moved the border. And so Nicaragua mobilized its troops to take the new territory bequeathed to it from Mountain View. Bitcoin and data.gov net neutrality and the golden shield, hyperbolic packet routing topologies, dot P2P and open DNS. Which of these really scales well and which obscure a common point? What long-term ramifications will the privatization of the common intellect by search and social network platforms have on our ability to self-govern? And or rather, toward what governmentality do they already provide us? And to underscore that, the point, these knotted questions are not exclusive to what is new. Emergent secular geographies, such as cloud computing, ubiquitous computing, emergent ethnoscapes, minoritarian psychogeographies, as well as archaic sacred geographies, which had once helped formulate the domain of states, Dar al-Islam, Christendom, Judea, both compete with states not only for claims over legitimate violence, but also claims over legitimate citizenship and the capacity to delineate borders. The stack, the megastructure, can be understood as a confluence of interoperable, standards-based, complex material information system of systems organized according to a vertical section. Topographic, a topographic model of layers and protocols. The stack is a standardized universal section. Now, the stack as we encounter it, and as I prototype it, is composed equally of social and human and analog layers. Thonic energy sources, gestures, affects, user actants, interfaces, cities and streets, rooms and buildings, organic and inorganic envelopes, and informational, non-human, computational, and digital layers, multiplex fiber optic cables, data centers, databases, data standards and protocols, urban scale networks, embedded systems, universal addressing tables. It's hard and soft systems intermingle and swap phase states, becoming harder and softer according to occult conditions. As a social cybernetics, the stack that we know and design composes both equilibrium and emergence, one oscillating into another in indecipherable and unaccountable rhythm, territorializing and deterritorializing the same component for diagonal purposes. But what is the state condition? And literally for governance, what state does it describe in advance? Let me then be specific about the stack that does exist, that already exists. In the body of this talk remains, I will then outline three layers of the emergent stack, cloud computing, ubiquitous computing, and augmented reality or act, you know, active interfaces. But first, it's important, I think, to understand really the stack as an abstract model and as a real technical machine. Consider then the OSI network model upon which the TCP IP stack and the global internet itself is indirectly based. 
each node in the network is represented by a terminal and is comprised of seven discrete layers from application layer down to the physical layer of wire. A message is sent by a user down the stack layer by layer until it is transmitted to the receiving node. At that point, the message travels back up the stack from physical layer to the application layer and is read by the next user. The model specifies that each layer can receive information from the layer above it and can pass information down the stack to the layer below it and or pass information laterally to a corresponding layer network to network as in so many so-called level two networks that link financial traders and trading centers. Now, key to the success of this model is its flexibility in absorbing future inventions in that new technical solutions can be employed at a, at a given layer, fiber optics instead of copper, copper wire at the physical layer, for example, a faster router uh, at, the, at, the trans, at the network layer, smarter application, et cetera. So long as that new, that new thing inserted adheres to the protocols that allow it to communicate with the adjacent layers. Now, for our purposes, the OSA, OSI model serves as both a literal technical uh, uh, apparatus for how network architectures operate between very large and small scales, and also as a kind of abstract machine, a pure model uh, for how unlike actors in a vertical sectional assemblage can be composed into a scalable, compossible metastructure. <clears throat> In this sense, OSI is analogous, both literally and figuratively, to the urban street grid. Now, if the stack, <clears throat> like any technology, can work to both constitute a political order or to stabilize a cultural economic order already in place, what is the program of the nomos of the cloud? To borrow from Walter Benjamin, is it a constitutive or constituent violence? Clearly, it's both. And the untangling of how so is the work of architects to come. OK, so my consideration of these three layers, cloud, ubiquitous computing, and AR, is based, I should say in advance, on a presumption that Paul Virilio's famous axiom that the invention of any new technology is also simultaneously the invention of a new kind of accident. The invention of the car is the invention of the car crash. The invention of the stock market is the invention of the stock market crash, and so on. Holds fast and true for the emergence of planetary computation. The nomos of the cloud and the stack. I then consider these, the, these technologies as three kinds of accidents. OK, the cloud, accident. Okay. The geopolitics of the cloud is everywhere and wants everything. Anonymous server routers from Egypt, anonymous the group going up against Mexican drug cartels, the Facebook, Twitter, YouTube stack in Cairo, Tor users building on Amazon, MPLS level two dark fiber networks connecting trading centers for optimal position to trading floors, gaming the speed of light and the microeconomics of transcontinental bandwidth with proprietary algorithms. While it would seem then that in terms of, for example, Roberto Esposito's immunological theory of borders, that these trans legal events might be understood as disruptive contaminations of a biopolitical order. Yet in their consistency, these exceptions constitute a new order. That order, that nomos, is composed from the structural and procedural protocols that locate different actors and technologies at different layers within an aggregate stack, and which thereby condition the actions they take from there. Far from counter-immunological, 
the stack, like the OSI layer, works because protocols both produce and police that information that can move up and down layer to layer, fixing their borders, designating passages to and fro. Now, low in the stack, above chthonic energy forces, but below the stratum of cities, is the layer of planetary scale cyber infrastructure we call simply the cloud. Aristophanes' play, The Clouds, was a parody of intellectual presumption, the gift economy of debt, and the virtualization of meaning into tactical rhetoric. Does the same go for our cloud polis? The cloud operates at a planetary scale, an unevenly ubiquitous computational mechanicosphere, a prototype Turing machine for which our human attempts at supercomputing are arranged in provisional and incomplete networks of data centers, databases, fiber optics, terminals, browsers. The cloud erases some geographies and produces others, territorializing and deterritorializing in competitive measure. The cloud's nomos is the proto-sovereign network geography, and it is at this level of the stack that the modern sovereignty of the state, which would produce one sort of public, and the aggregate urbanism of information, energy, and concrete that interpolates another come into direct conflict, overlapping and interweaving one another without universal jurisdiction or resolution. So the integral accident of this layer is one of rotated and interwoven geography of sovereignty, like Bazel and Olkuma in China Mieville's The City and the City, two cities only partially visible to one another even as they occupy the same location, constantly policing one another's breaching. Consider the Google China conflict of 2009. It can be interpreted uh, as a geopolitical conflict between dominant empires, both leveraging their different state, corporate, military information network systems to claim the free soil of planetary computational territory. But I think the, the conflict was more fundamental than that, between, than that of between two mega state actors. It was and is a conflict not only for the right to control search results, but indeed for the predominance of two modes of sovereignty. A state sovereignty that would dominate and determine the network sovereignty of information and energy flows versus a network information sovereignty that would, by assembling users into another real network, another imagined community, come to, in essence, escape the final sovereignty of the state to determine another polity in its image one that is both too small for the state to control, data packets moving over wide area mobile networks regardless of any great firewall, and too big for it to control. It connects people and things and banks of data across planets, a massively distributed post-state actor not circumscribed by any stretch of land, but spread across a layer in a vertical sectional global stack. The breach theory of Dr. Fan Bingjing, an academician at the China Academy of Engineering, who is one of the main designers of the infamous firewall, is upon this point truly breathtaking. Earlier this month, he said at a conference that the Chinese, quote, that the Chinese internet does not have the capacity, lamented that the Chinese internet does not have the capacity to disable a global internet service whenever desirable. And he used the example of Google and said it was a pity that although Google had retreated from China, its service was still accessible there. I'm quoting him. It's like the relationship between a riverbed and water. Water has no nationality, but riverbeds are sovereign territories. We cannot allow polluted water from other nation states to enter our country. Now, to extend the figure of water from a metaphor to a real location, Consider that for Schmidt's theory of the nomos of European political geography, that the territorial geography of nations was always defended by the naval capacity 
over the omnidirectional glacis of the ocean in light of Google's recently filed patent on wa offshore water-based data centers. This floating cyber infrastructure would, in principle, greatly reduce the energy and cooling costs of hosting and serving the peta and exabytes of data that will constitute an eventual planetary cloud computing platform. It may also symbolize a productive crisis of territorial jurisdiction and how truly pervasive computation may demand or activate new forms of agonistic and or cosmopolitan political habitats. Data centers, the hard technical core of the internet, use, as you know, a lot of energy, mostly to keep processors cool. And with something like only 1.8 of the world's estimated 7 billion people using the World Wide Web in any given month, the anticipated growth curve is steep. Where will the energy come from? How can Google possibly feed the energy appetite of the data centers that would provide ambient supercomputing to the next two or three or four billion human users and the next 50 to 500 billion objects of the Internet of Things? Oceanic data centers theoretically would help solve this by using both tidal and wind energy to power the stations as well as an abundant supply of water to assist in the cooling process. But in doing so, the literal offshoring of such critical infrastructure also raises other issues about the jurisdictional and legal control of data and the governance of the emergent territory we call the cloud. That offshoring neatly portends the integral accident of the cloud and of its layer of the larger stack. The delamination of territory, economy, and sovereignty, one from another, potentially perforating the domain of the state with economies of non-state infrastructure beamed in from the middle of the open ocean. The nomos of the cloud is not a two-dimensional map, but a vertical sectional stack. Its topology, its topology and topography is defined by the superimposition of layers of sovereign claims over the same site or person or event. Its fundamental generative spatial exception is less the camp than the enclave, the interweaving of discontiguous sovereignties. Those generalized enclaves, like those that layer Google upon China, are the exceptions that, in fact, constitute the new rule, the nomos of the stack, and within the stack, the cloud that is that interwoven sectional architecture. Okay. Next is ubiquitous computing. One effect that the political geographic of this political and geographic rotation is a disturbance in the capacity of money to represent the exchange value of things and of files and of work. This is a crisis of addressability, a de-addressing of things, and one that is consolidating a collapse within, if not also, of the world economy. But it is not nearly the first time that an encounter with a new world of unaddressed space generates confusion over the modality of sovereign claims and over an unfinished division according to, according to what type of earth is claimed, land or sea or air, and now information, each always allocated and addressed differently, as Schmidt's history makes clear. The integral accident of ubiquitous computing, then, this ne the next layer up in the stack, is the abyssal scope of deeply granular universal addressability and the challenges to thought that it demands. An address is more than a unique identifier. It also refers to the capacity of one addressee to exchange information with another according to the protocols of the universal system that links them. One, for example, one building can, with an address can exchange information with another through the postal network that addresses those buildings by the logical hierarchical system of postal code, country, street, number, et cetera. That is, address names both the source and the ultimate <coughs> destination of information. 
and is, as in Thomas Pinchon's The Crying of Lot 49, the control of the postal address code is core to how states, real and imagined, can see and manage territory. Ubiquitous computing, for its part, depends upon many competing schemes for the globally unique identifier and universal addresses of websites, locations, and network connected objects from massive to microscopic scale. Some track homology between real and virtual objects. For, you know, for example, the Tour Eiffel in Paris and the Tour Eiffel in Second Life. Or an instance in a database and a thing in a shipping container. Whereas others are true addresses that structure information between nodes in a universal network, such as the IP address that identify unique internet connected uh, terminals, objects, nodes, and use this to properly route packets, information packets, one to the other. Others, such as IBM's recently open source MQTT, message queue telemetry transport system, broker signals between more local ecologies of Internet of Things. And as at any time in the history of geography, a core function of political power is the inscription and management of an orthodox map and the addresses that it organizes. If you are unnamed as an address, you cannot speak or be spoken to. Resistance to this history was, of course, core to the situationist redesign of the modern city. Now, for the internet, that organization, the address, is IP version 4. Those are the addresses. When you look at an address site and you have this little string of numbers and dots, this is IP version 4 that identify today everything connected to the internet and route packets to and from. There is, however, a potential crisis uh, with IP version 4 and its ability to map a growing internet and a viable ubiquitous computing layer. That is, we've run out of them, run out of addresses. Earlier this year, the final blocks of 16 million, the IPv4 addresses are allocated in blocks of 16 million. Addresses were allocated to the five RER, regional internet registries. Now you've probably never heard of the RIRs. Uh, I hadn't heard of them until I started doing this research. But these are transnational bodies that are responsible for allocating the addresses that provide access to the global internet. AFRINIC, ARIN, which covers North America, APNIC, LACNIC, RIPE, which covers Europe. Now, considering the significance of this internet becoming, in, the, that has become in one way, one specific way, full, I was interested in seeing a map of the global address space uh, and indeed in the long history of cartography of world maps going back to the Greeks, Westphalia, Mercator projections, and most importantly, perhaps to medieval Islamist geographies like La Rogerina, the cosmogram of a now full IPv4 address space would compare. So I was surprised then that none existed. So uh, last week in collaboration with the San Diego Supercomputing Center, we made one, um, an ugly one, but it exists nevertheless. Now you'll note two things right away. First, that even though each of these little squares is 16 million addresses, First, uh, you'll know that, that even though most of the presumed growth, presumed growth in users is in South America, Asia, and Africa, North America, that is, in North America and Europe, that is, Aaron and Ripe, uh, control a disproportionate quantity of this geography. Um, second, you'll notice that each block, again, each is 16 million addresses, this whole quadrant up here on the top left uh, is claimed uh, the addresses are controlled and claimed and licensed to uh, a whole group of private and military actors such as Apple, Microsoft, Halliburton, the U.S. Department of Defense, the U.K. Ministry of Defense, Merck, Lilly, um, and you'll see right there in the thing a, a guy uh, named Stephen something who um, is actually at UCSD uh, and a long time ago managed to get this whole space allocated to him for packet radio. Now, the new economy of scarcity, then, is the geopolitics of addressability. 
and already existing technical technological solutions to a too small address space are unlikely to be implemented anytime soon. There is hard power in soft addresses. And to top, in the top left hand corner of this map is the beachfront real estate. One of those technical solutions is IP version 6. I, I won't bother you with the story of IP5, which is an 100, IP version 6 is a 128 bit address string. So you ask the question, when would we run out of, of IPv6 addresses, 128-bit string? Well, if you were to divide 128-bit address string, the total possible numbers that you could fill up that, and divide that by 7 billion people, it would be, we would be able to theoretically allocate something in the order of 10 to the 23 addresses per person. That is an incomprehensible number. 10 to the 23 is roughly equal to the number of known stars or to the number of grains of sand on Earth. However, it must be said, many orders of magnitude fewer than the number of possible books in Borges's Library of Babel. If you were to assign an address to 10 to the 23 things over the course of your life, every piece of paper, every word on every piece of paper, every subway ticket, whatever, oh, you, would you would never possibly use up this, this answer. You would, be, you would have to move down to an, a, a molecular scale to distribute 10 to the 23 addresses to these things. Addresses for individual letters in books, hairs on heads of people you run across, blood cells, specks of dust. So I was interested then in experimenting with that granularity, trying to get a picture of it so that it might be, at least to me, a bit more un understandable. So in collaboration with the Nano3 lab, also in Cal AT2, we wrote a single IPv6 address with an electron lithography beam onto, into a silicon wafer and photographed it using the scanning electron microscope. So the address you see here is about 10 micrometers in width, about the size of a red blood cell. The lines of each digit is about 50 nanometers in thickness. But this is really only part of the story. Deep addressability, as we would want to really examine it, would allow, yes, for the identification of, of things down to a, this incomprehensible granular level, things with mass. But it would also allow for the addressability of relations between things. Right, this this microphone that I'm wearing could have an address, but the fact that but the fact that I'm near it, and in relation with it to it could have an address as well. There is then both a kind of graph theory, and a set theory problem at work. I can address a discrete thing, and an abstract envelope of relations that could extend that could extend it to infinity, things with mass, things without mass. So to extend Heidegger's parable of the fourfold, the bottle of wine could have an address, but so could each of the worldly <laughs> earthly processes that combine together to result in this particular thing. Not just addressable nouns, but addressable verbs to events. Deep addressability then includes not only discrete entities, but also multiple levels of abstraction, <coughs> as well as the traces of those abstractions and even the abstractions of abstractions that we hold for them. So there is then, in a way, a homology between the universal addressability of discrete assemblages with mass and indiscrete assemblages without mass, thing that we call things or concepts, with the flat ontology of speculative realism and or Latour's irreductionism. The parliament of things and the internet of things are related as are the ding politique as the ge and the geopolitics of addressability. That is, I could never possibly exhaust 10 to the 23 physical things, but I could easily exhaust that many relations of relations of relations of relations in an instant were we to extend relationality all the way down into the abyss. 
So put another way, the exhaustion of any full allocation of IPv6 exists therefore somewhere between never and instantaneously. And that architecture of the middle is your design brief. The phrase Internet of Things implies a network of physical objects. I prefer some, the more esoteric sounding Internet of Hexeities, which would include objects, but also concepts and memes addressable at the same level, but at multiple scales, through the same system. Scales blur, and what seems solid becomes fuzzy. <coughs> Inevitably, we see that apparently solid, solid scale is really only a temporary state of resolution. Things in the world always communicate and exchange information. DNA, RNA, flowers exchange information with bees, sunlight exchanges information with celluloid film. Things inform one another in specific ways. And this specificity is what Michel Serre called communication, the work of Hermes. I see ubiquitous computing not just as a new logistics, but as a new literature. Massively addressable spaces is not only a way to map and describe the world, it is a creative medium in its own right. It is not only a way to describe things by giving them a discrete number, it's ultimately also a way to compose and create lines of connection, association, and metaphor. It's an authoring medium. This week, also, we composed a, I said this was all new, new stuff. This week, we composed a, a new set of poetry um, comprised entirely of IPv6 addresses assigned to specific objects and to perceived relations between them. The next page, uh, let's see. So the text on the page is just addresses, but the network of the resolution into things, relation, and events is the abstraction of associative language. So deep address is not only a way to map the world, it's a way to compose the world, to create new concepts and logics of association between apparently unlike things, words, ideas, places, with an alphabetic language that is also, because it is software, an executable code. And I think this conjunction between the addressing of discrete things and their active, if more abstract, associations, and this concrete literalization of set theory a relational poetics built on the quantification of sets has implications not only for art and literature, but for through them for everything from climate science and urban planning to neuroscience and nanomedicine. Last then, in highest in the stack that we'll discuss is augmented reality. At the highest level of the stack, with the most local form of agency, and also the most formally represented politically, is the user, the actant, the subject. And one level below them, and structuring their access to the stack and its access to them, are interfaces. Interfaces instrumentalize the affordances of the stack for users and actants, and thereby mediate users' connections to one another through its many layers. If those actants are machines, the interfaces through which they perceive the stack may be specialized sensors, codes, or switches. If they are instead phenomenologically <coughs> complex subjects, such as humans, then the affective intensity of iconic, symbolic, and indexical signs not only synthesize technological affordances, sig signification, but also narrativize the meaning of possible actions that users might take significance. One interface avant-garde blends a range of semiotic technologies with direct ideological description of the landscapes a user is inhabiting. Augmented reality, AR, can be defined as a set of technologies which directly project a layer of specific indexical and interfacial signs upon a given perceptual field of vision. AR thereby transforms the resulting landscape into a designable instrumental frame by the use of different techniques. The subtitling of objects and events, the superimposition of navigation tools, the overlaying of iconic graphical user interface menus upon real world systems, 
the use of cinematic insertions and elisions, and other artificial visual or auditory feedbacks to which local signification and significance are programmed. As the interface layer within the stack, augmented reality performs the imagistic and linguistic mediation between actants, one layer above, and the ubiquitous computational, uh, ubiquitous computational capacities of their habitats, one layer below. As a design space, it's a platform for staging, animating, composing, and accounting for communication between actants and their worlds. And unlike traditional mechanical or screen-based user interfaces, it performs this as ambient, artificially embodied perception. Now, while I define interface as any point of contact which governs the condition of exchange between two complex systems, within augmented reality, the conditions of exchange, the, with, uh, within augmented reality, the dominant mode of the interface, the GUI, that is the icon with, that when clicked initiates a feedback loop, melts, so it seems, into reality itself and is perceived as a direct property of surfaces, things, and events. That melting becomes the scope of design, the register of work, a touch point of advertising, and perhaps even especially of activist theology. How can we locate AR among modern media and their psychological and psychoanalytic effects? We might say in tribute to Friedrich Kittler's famous, uh, famous association of film with the imaginary, the typewriter with the symbolic, and the gramophone with the real. His, the, his Lacanian quasi-stack could be reworked in augmented reality such that the imaginary is so directly inscribed into the symbolic as the content of the interface and the real is, is, that the real is itself collapsed into the imaginary, making the reality of augmented reality itself perhaps irredeemably a cult. How so? The most impending accident of augmented reality is, I suppose, a deeply granular, pervasive advertising by which our embodied perceptions uh, and gestures generate the monetizable exchange value of the network user profile. It's where the micro-targeting business models of cognitive capitalism melt into the choreography of the mobile user and subject. The work that the user subject already does to perfect targeting algorithms for search engines can be scaled from finger points and clicks to the very musculature and dance of dwelling itself. However, I fear that ultimately a less secular danger in AR and what is, and what is the most killer app is not marketing, but fundamentalist religion. Augmented reality promises the design of a differential sacrality whereby the Carl Schmittian, Manichaean, political, theological segmentation of the polis into friend and enemy becomes a direct and literal annotation of the life world. So it's the subtitling of clean and unclean, ours and theirs, sacred and profane, empire and rebel forces, orc and not orc, red team and blue team, Will mature augmented reality initiate a wave of bizarre new sects, cults, and activist versions of fundamentalist monotheisms for which the metaphorical nuance of holy books is collapsed by the direct imprint of virtual worlds onto real things? There are indications so. We can see that in the use of Google Maps, Google Earth, stolen SIM cards, and other advanced but off-the-shelf spatial command and communications technologies by Lashkar Itaiba during their attack on Mumbai in 2008 as a prototype for the kinds of weaponized augmented reality we might fear. It is both, it is a more violent and extreme variation of, on creationist video games for the homeschooling economy in the US or the Christian augmented reality overlay of the Grand Canyon in, in Arizona which explains how the canyon, explains how the canyon um, proves creationism and disproves evolution to those willing to look through the lens and see what it sees. Phone apps that give Qibla directions or which allow users to scan barcodes to determine if products are kosher or halal seem like benign and obvious innovations. One hopes th that the poetry of these monotheistic cognitive cultures can withstand the unambiguous cybernetic literalism 
that augmented reality might afford them and the violence that the absolute explication can demand. Okay, ontology beyond both Agamben's anthropological machine and Schmidt's own friend versus enemy distinction towards something that is more, more plastic, more machinic, more designable. The stack there that is, is pharmacon, both remedy and poison, both mechanism of a disruptive cosmopolitics and a catastrophic homogenization of information technologies into what Mumford called a mega machine. On the pharmacon and techniques and in consideration of the granularity of deep address, let me close then with a quote from Bernard Stiegler. From the platonic critique of the pharmacon is the thought that all exteriorization leads to the possibility, not only for knowledge, but for power, to take control of these processes of transindividuation by mastering the development of categorization, of categorization. In particular, since the formation of the Greek logos, what is key here for taking control of meta-categorization, the production of a meta-language, as all rational disciplines in our societies, and more generally, all forms of deep attention rest upon these meta-languages. So I would argue that the positive vision of the stack is then analogous perhaps to a new civis Romanus sum, a mode of trans-individual sovereignty derived not from blood or land, but, for, uh, but from a commonly held relationship to infrastructure. In this case, the composite infrastructure of a meta-global city that is simultaneously concrete, glass, steel, energy, water, information, and the promiscuous combination of the above substances. The stack is finally an architecture of such promiscuities. Thanks. fascinating <laughs> display of the work in progress. Um, you, in, in, in explaining uh, uh, the phenomena of the cloud and of, of the stack, mm. what I would ask you as an old man, perhaps, <laughs> is, mm -hmm. is, is the question of uh, the value judgment or what you, on the end, in your conclusion, say that you see certain positivism in it. Mm -hmm. uh, but during all lecture, you've been not qualifying, let's say, your research or your findings. Uh, you, you present them as they are, a kind of objective, uh, in terms of their, perhaps, performances. Mm -hmm. But my question would be, one, one once enter, uh, if you wish, physically or conceptually into the stack performance between the different layers, how one is able to establish some sort of value judgments? Or are they kind of obscure in that environment? They're worse than obscure. Uh, I, you know, if it were possible to establish with any degree of certainty the conditions by which a useful value judgment could be made, about a technology that mm. is still emerging, it would be a good thing to do. I don't, if, you're, if you have an idea of how to do that, I, don't, I would be happy to, to mm. learn, learn how with this as well. So this is why I begin and end with this idea of pharmacon, right? which of mm. course comes from Plato's you know, dialogues mm. with, 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 with Socrates, and, re and originally refers to, the, to writing itself, yeah. and the technology of writing as something that's both remedy and poison. Mm. So I keep these two ideas in mind. One, that these, any of these technologies are pharmacological in that sense, and that, mm -hmm. and that everything that they do is both you know, simultaneously for the good and for the ill, mm -hmm. and that any kind of ethical or 
politically informed ethics, even more importantly, you know, trans, in, trans individual ethics about them, has to be predicated on the idea that they, that they do both at the same time, which I think is parallel, in a way, to the, the other Virilio's idea that mm. any technology is yeah, also an accident. But at the same time, that any accident, any, the invention of any new accident is also the invention of a new technology. It, wor it works both of these ways as well. Mm. But I think to go to the core of your question, which is not an old man question at all, it's exactly the one we need to be ask, asking at this point, is if, if we can recognize, at least provisionally, that the emergence of, not, of these layers of these technologies is not sort of one thing happening here, plus one thing happening here, plus one thing happening there, but actually have a, seem to be coming together as a kind of new structural spatial order, and one of the things that they're doing in that emergent is the disembedding, dis disentanglement, perforation of older geopolitical orders from which they have produced war and pestilence and, and genocide, but have also produced citizenship uh, and other sorts of modes of sovereignty with which, and, and universal rights and human, other sorts of things with which we depend upon in one way or another. Then it's exactly the question of, of what what are these things designing? Yeah. What what is the stack? Design, what is the geopolitics mm. of the stack? What is the geopolitics of the stack is designing? And what are we capable? Not just not just what is the geopolitics that we would mm. want to design from it, but first, are we even capable of, of doing that? Mm. But for me, the design question is not so much. It, this is not just the design at a geopolitical scale. It's the design of the geopolitical. It's yeah. the design of the nomos and what that geopolitical mm. would need to be, which has to be an ethically informed question. And by all means, it has to be. Mm. Uh, it, but then, sort of said, but at the same time, you have to be modest enough to realize that determining the ethics of these of, a, of these emergences in advance of themselves is probably mm. impossible. Yeah. And yet, here we are. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Um, when one looks into consequences, perhaps, uh, uh, and Philip talks about it, then I always ask Philip, are we not entering, in maybe traditional terms, in a kind of post-human era, as we know it previously, you know, where we would say, yes, we humans are kind of creators, either we, you know, group ourselves by religious or political or sovereignty principles, are we with, with, with computationalism and with the possibilities of the, you know, computer on a global scale to, you know, perform as mm -hmm. you explain what is performing, are kind of, uh, kind of basically, you know, basically going in a, in a, in a, in a, in a radically different post-human world. Quite possibly, and, and again, even that in of itself would have both positive and negative connotations. Yeah. And so, I mean, let me let me sort of, on the one hand, you know, at a very at a superficial level, the sociology of computation is one through things like Facebook yeah. is something that doesn't so much do, doesn't liquefy the the kind the, the a formal social self identity. It actually concretizes it, right? Yeah. Where what had previously been a just informal biography of your life now becomes this very public and very concrete form of an instantiated self-accounting mm -hmm. in the Foucauldian sense, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what mm -hmm. Foucault would make of Facebook, yeah. is that, that was, you know, yeah. if he had lived, probably would have been the, the, yeah, the, the yeah, 13th yeah. book. To link the bodies. Yeah, yes, right. <laughs> but at the same time, I think you're right. There is a way in which it does refer to this post, the, the post-human, but we can think of this in at least two sense. One is in this way that I try to link Latour's idea of parliament of things, mm. that is the objective things of the world, ecologies, objects, you know, na natural systems, mm. are not something on top of which human politics works. They are part, we are part of those systems. And the way in which we need to design a geopolitical system is one that understands those processes not as an exterior, not as an outside nature, not as something lower, but as in part of us. And that means, probably means, displacing the traditional Renaissance modern model of the human as the Vitruvian center from which all of these things radiate into just another intelligent actor among other intelligent actors. One thing that needs to be represented among other things that need to be, that needs to be represented. And I think that kind of ecological perspective would probably be an enormously positive one. Mm. At the same time, 
at the same time, we rely upon the fiction of, the, of, of anthropocentrism to derive kinds, you know, antiquated notions of human dignity and all these other kinds of things that also prevents biotechnological catastrophes from turning our own bodies into just another form of commodified flesh that can be bought and sold and cloned and sliced and diced like, the, like what we do to other animals. Mm. Right? So we rely upon the fiction to prevent, to prevent ourselves from auto-annihilation. Right. And finally, if I may, is, is about your uh, kind of uh, uh, conclusion to say that, that it is it, it, it is a sort of more plastic, more design-like situation. Mm -hmm. And do you really think here in terms of a traditional sense of design or a way in which uh, you know, something could, could be kind of formed, and, but then when it is formed, when it is designed, my question would be, what is the way in which uh, to evaluate you know, the, 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 the design, if you wish, of the yeah. cloud or of a process which clearly does influence uh, uh, you know, processes on the ground, it and is a process on the ground. Yeah, yeah that's it what is a process yeah, of the ground yeah. in itself. But then the question is, once one is about to evaluate, could, could one, one, is one supposed to evaluate from within, so to speak, yeah. through the very you know, understanding of the process, or maybe from outside, a kind of politically, economically, ethically, if you wish? Both, I think. Both. I, I think they're. I think they're both. I think they're very closely related. I, you know, I would say that the design that I'm talking about, the sort of plasticity, mm. right, which is of course, you know, word I yeah. draw from Malibu and her yeah. idea of the plasticity of the world, mm. um, is, is a very, in, in a way, a very traditional idea of design. De design as in the, as in designation, as in to designate and determine in advance the structure of a thing and of a system to 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 project and enforce that projection in, in a particular kind of way. Mm. But in terms of the criteria of evaluation, I'm not particularly interested in the sort of classical aesthetic models of you mm. know, proportion or this is, you know, yeah. is the stack, should it be seven or eight? Yeah. Is eight mm -hmm. a more rational number? I mean, yeah. this is not the issue, right? Yeah. The issue is basically this. Um, design, as I see it, always does its best work in, relation, in reaction to and in relation to an emergency. Mm. Yeah. Design, the best work design the happens response. is not when we can do anything we want, mm. but when, we abs when, we, when it is possible to do radical transformative design on a large scale, mm. is when we have to. And, you know, as of today, take your pick. What emergency do you want to, mm. you know, are, you know are, is the climate going to collapse? Mm. Where are we going to get water from? How are we going to feed 10 billion people? We're, we're sitting on top of multiple self-reinforcing systemic collapses, let alone, you know, what is money, mm. right? The euro's in my pocket. I yes. mean, what are, what are they going to be in six months? Yeah. Wallpaper? Mm. Anyway, so mm. the, um, these are the emergencies, I think, that design mm. is responsive. Right. And the question of the stack is that if found problem is it's, de it's designing those emergencies mm. for us faster than we're responding to them. Mm. So the evaluation of, uh, of the criteria of success is, is survival. Mm. And how you Are would, we still there? I have a lot of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You would have time to put here. Yeah. And how you would then put in this in this debate a, a political? Because now the, it's a huge critique on a political. Political is too slow. It still looks to the sovereign countries. You have to change constitutions. Market is very fast. That's why euro is collapsing. So how you see the new political, not maybe the traditional political? Is that any possibility of a political engagement or logic, if you wish? There's more than a possibility. There's a proliferation of it. And I don't think we quite know how to make sense of it. So some of it is, now let me be clear. The argument I'm make, making is not that states go away. Right. No, no, I think no, the emergence. No, it's not the no I mean, if we look at the, all the BRIC countries of China and yeah. Russia and you know yeah. India, and, and Venezuela, these are strong state institutions. Yeah. They are being increasing. They are increasingly defining the terms of their own sovereignty in relationship to their capacity to adjudicate yeah. the stack, and, and that's the transformation I'm going to see at work. But you know, uh, 
Certainly, there are any number of ways in which we can redefine the political and what constitutes these as well. I mean, is the use of social media in Egypt and these other sorts of things, is, yeah. that's, is this a political infrastructure and is it is some other sorts of other kinds of things in a way? Um, but ultimately, you know, in the big scheme of things, my larger interest would have to be to define, to, if we're talking about sort of like how do we redefine the political, I think questions of, eco questions of ecology and yeah. questions of the sustainability of the systems of, that is the, 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 at, at, yeah. a, at, a, at a planetary scale has to be the beginning and ending by which we define any of these by which we define any of these things. And the languages we need to develop are ones that are allowed to represent that we can act inanimate and non human actors, especially systemic actors, uh, have to be we have to find a way in which they can actually be represented according to this as well. Or maybe even representation isn't the issue. Maybe the models of political representation themselves right. need to be rethought and it's more of about systems of imminence. Mm -hmm. by which the imminent interrelationship between these systems can actually enforce their own capacities. Yeah. So it's not about making new laws, it's about how other things can take on the force of law, even mm -hmm. informally. Mm -hmm. yep. Thanks, yeah. Benjamin. Yep. No questions for Benjamin, but... Yeah, I have a question that's actually uh, a continuation of what uh, Bergen asked. Yeah. Because Schmidt also writes that the technical is always a way to escape the political. Um, well, Schmidt's wrong about all kinds of stuff. Schmidt yeah, Schmidt was, <laughs> Schmidt was, a, was, a, was a stoop with a Nazi. Or no. I mean, it was a bad thing. So I'm, not I'm, using, Schmidt. I'm using your I'm, example, not mine. I'm, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm, but like, but like, anyway, I'm using Schmidt like, like a million other people. I'm using Schmidt for my own purposes, vitriloquizing him to make him say what I wanted to say. I'm not, not always going to defend Schmidt per se. No, but but, but nevertheless, go ahead. My point yeah. is that yeah. here the two seem to be. Um, uh, one and the same, right? Because, they are, yeah, um, right. No, you're right. It's a, your, your point is, go, but continue, right? but I follow your line and I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because for Schmidt, when all problems have technical solutions, there will be no more politics, right? Um, but you're highlighting the political aspects uh, of the technical, in a way, locating the sovereign within the technical, and even saying that Google is a, is a sovereign, somehow using Schmidt to disprove Schmidt. And Using Schmidt to disprove Schmidt, I like that. Yeah. Um, I'll buy that. So yeah. My, uh, my yeah. question is really if, if the political is, you say, for example, the geopolitical, if, if political is even the right term to use, maybe it's. Possibly, possibly not. Geo yeah, it's quite possible. Yeah. Economy or geo. Something. Yeah, I don't, you know, we've, I've actually gone through, we, I had a very long discussion with Mackenzie Wark, who came out to our conference recently, because I knew, Arguing whether or not political geopolitics was the right word, and we, we both agreed that it doesn't. It has connotations that are inappropriate for what we want to do, that we couldn't come up with a better one for this as well. It, uh, it wouldn't sound completely bizarre and obscure and affectatious. So if you can come up with one, I'd be happy to to put your name on the way as well. But you're right. I agree that this. I mean, Schmidt is correct. His opposition of the political and the technical is one that I don't occur. I mean, I think I tried to make the argument that these dynamics of sovereignty, the dynamics of the no move, the dynamics of the friend energy distinction, the dynamics of these cleavages, are not something simply that the technical accomplishes on the on behalf of the political. And the, the political somehow wields technology to accomplish these things, but that the the, the very enactment of those things is simultaneously technical and political in such a way that it's impossible to, to interweave them. And, and that the real history below Schmidt's history of the nomos is a history of the technical capacities to inscribe, to envision, mm. to do all the things that the nomos does. And without the ability, you know, you know, it's without the ability for states to see things in a particular way. You have the mechanisms of vision and enforcement and inscription, they're the, 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 the content of the nomos is empty. Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, thank you. Very interesting talk. I'm sorry for my uh, little bit cold I uh, have. But um, I have a question specific on the augmented reality. Yeah. Um, you, you were talking about um, the influence it has on the reality. It's mainly visual at the moment. Are there any signs of interference with sound or yeah. senses, or maybe even uh, emotions or thoughts that will eventually lead maybe to a lot of more relations also yeah. to the deep addresses of the like the 128 bit idea? If you have influences in so many things, maybe even on thoughts, you need a lot of addresses to comprehend that. Mm -hmm. and Further on, is that resulting in sort of optimized individuals that are just part of the stack? 
And yeah. is that then resulting maybe to the idea of that the human is not in the center anymore, but just part of the whole system? Okay, so that's three, that's three yeah. things, right? I got it, three, okay. The first one, the augmented reality and, and, and audio, you're exactly right. I mean, it's exactly, it's at this point. There are, some, there are a lot of interesting projects recently that are, are working, in this, working in this area. Um, there's one reason that just got listed for a friend of mine, Perry Hall, made for the iPad. And basically what it does is it ho it's a bit sort of vision and audio. I mean, I'm just spinning anecdotally here. But you hold it up to a particular surface. And the way he coded it is that the either by, I'm looking at the cloth here, either by the sort of the dynamics of dark and light or the, or the, the regularity of patterns, it creates a certain sort of sound. Right, so like, it, like it would, so if you moved it across this, it would go blah, 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 yeah. because it sees the sort of structure here as well, right? So it's, a, it's almost a kind of um, synesthesia, you know, synesthesia, um, a, a way of sort of using audio to, to transmit the sound as well. In a way, sort of very much the way in which a sound designer in a film would, right? Um, and you know, I think the best. Just to sort of think, I think the best, one of the best treatises on augmented reality is not about augmented reality. It's uh, Ada McGoyan, the Toronto, the Canadian filmmaker, wrote a whole book on subtitles a as a graphical element and as a linguistic element within the film, and the subtitling logic within within this within this structure as well. Um, but I mean, in a general sense, AR can include anything from walking around the city with your iPod on mm -hmm. and creating a different kind of uh, set relationship with, yeah. with this with this as well. So that every so it's certainly uh, it's it's certainly wide open. The difference, though, I think, between the iPod and any of those things is that AR refers to not a a system of the, the presentation of artificial information, but as an interface. Is, so that artificial, that artificial information that's produced is actually a it's something that if you you know, quote unquote, point and click, it actually causes effects, feedback effects down into the system, yeah. right? So what is what the, what, is what a sound extra? that you click is? Yeah, um, is it an extra or is yeah. it when it when it starts to point that it's not an extra anymore, like an overlay, but it starts to actually alter the reality. Mm -hmm. Like if you perceive something in reality, it's also transformed to transformed to your brain. So in the end, if you Transfer that or alter that. Yeah. That information that goes to your brain uh, with future technologies, for instance, it will drastically maybe change the augmented reality more to to a more to implemented a, right. and not it's like an extra overlay. To a, to a, I think this goes to your third part to yeah. this kind of cyborg. Well, uh, I don't want to brain control. I have a sort of vision of yeah, like no no influences or optimized individuals, but I'm just interested if you talk about such in, um, complex stacks uh, and clouds. It kind of simplifies. Um, <coughs> the complexity is almost like nature uh, in a way because it becomes so complex, and we mm -hmm. uh, normal system, conventional system, simplify everything and. Uh, in that way, I just thought about maybe that there is like a, a relation to it, and our, our, our like our role as human in that system becomes less or less controllable. I, I think it probably does. Yeah, I think it does. But, it, but in what way that it does, I think is the open is the is the open question, yeah. right? And I think the way in which that you know we what are the conditions of our abdication mm -hmm. that we're willing to uh, that we're willing to put forth in order to survive. Yeah, uh, I think it's probably where we're looking at this as well. In terms of the mind, I mean, one of you know, as you probably know, one of the most important <coughs> frontiers of research within uh, computer science is, of course, artificial intelligence. And one of the most important areas of research within neuroscience is connectionist and and and, and uh, neural network models, which both share a kind a lot of overlap. And within a kind of information ontology and structures of the world. And in my university, there's several faculty that have joint appointments with both, both areas of, of modeling the mind as an information, modeling the brain specifically as an information processing structure, mm -hmm. and modeling information processing systems as, as, a, as, as, form, as forms, of, forms of intelligence, which is another kind of decentering de of the human from this as well, when we mm -hmm. really let go not only of this of the central specialness of the human within a broader yeah. ecology, but really even let go of the idea of mind 
and the, the, we rarely to deal with the idea of, of brains and bodies and, and the kind of deep, deep materialism that being able to understand ourselves only as you know as brains would do. Anyway, yeah. we could go on and on. And yeah. But yes, well, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Could you pause the mic? Talking about uh, the three points, um, the cloud, the ambiguous uh, computing, and uh, augmented reality, mm -hmm. which uh, you call um, an accident. So I'm uh, very curious about the accident, and my question is uh, in how can we escape this uh, um, accidental uh, dynamics uh, mm -hmm. which we're in? Because um, it's, um, it's hardly understandable with the research and um, um, if we're not uh, capable to evaluate uh, um, the findings, uh, how can we decide if we want or we do not want? Uh, to, to follow this, uh... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, this, um, this this is a big question. This is a big question. Let, let me be clear that I, that is the that is it. the accident that I'm talking about. The argument of the accident is that the invention is the appearance of any new technology or any novelty, any genuine innovation within a system, inevitably produces forms of of. Um, distortion and collapse within that system. So the, the introduction of a, of a different species of plant or, the, or carnivorous toads into an ecosystem will cause the disruption and collapse of other areas of the ecosystem as well. The invention is also a kind of, a kind of accident. The optimistic side of this is that the accident itself, as I say, is also potentially a kind of technology, that it becomes another regular actor within, within, the, within, within this kinds of system. But the question that you're asking, I think, is, is, a, is well put, and it's a different version of, I think, the question that you asked, which is, how do we evaluate, and is it possible to evaluate in advance what the outcomes of any of these technologies will be, and whether those outcomes are outcomes that we want, whether they're in the image of the world that we wish to project, we, we wish to project ourselves, project ourselves into. And my answer to him would have been the same to you, is that I don't, I'm unconvinced that there's a way in which we can truly evaluate in advance any of our designs, not just avant-garde information technologies, but 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 you know, well understood uh, technological forms of, of of intervention. That the reverberations of these interventions within complex systems are, in, and, and more so, the more complex the system are are of. Uh, are unknown. The argument then with this as well, it, it could be, if you want to understand in terms of information networks, is that we need to build something like firewalls into the system as well. Deleuze and Guattari talk about delinking of global systems. By, by delinking global systems, you have smaller ecologies where if something goes catastrophically wrong, it, can be, it doesn't necessarily spread out to everything all around it. Does it make sense? Right, so whether that's a fungus that grows in a particular crop of rice that doesn't destroy the entire rice crop, or a uh, housing derivatives that can be contained and doesn't, and doesn't actually um, destroy the entire sort of system. So what are those firewalls, essentially? How can we segment and delink parts of the integrated system such in a way that we can actually perhaps more methodically prototype alternatives in a way in which what goes on in the smaller micro area um, uh, doesn't necessarily have reverber immediately have global reverberations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Thank you very much for the very interesting. Uh, the question I have relates to something that you mentioned uh, a bit in passing, but uh, yep. it was very fascinating. I think. Uh, you identified uh, somehow four modes or four steps of making a political claim. The first was capture and then delineation and then ordering and finally the making of a cosmogram. Right. Um, do you think that uh, the stack somehow fundamentally transforms this, uh, four, these four modes of making a political claim, especially in terms of the cosmogram? Do you think that the, the cosmogram uh, 
somehow the, the making of a cosmic grammar is facilitated by the stack on an individual basis or a, a collective basis, or how the cosmic grammar fits in? I think the co you know it's a good question. Let me just repeat the sort of point. So the four stages which are put together have to do with the um, the stages of the nomos, let's say, and its subdivision of sovereignty, which is first an arbitrary territorial capture, then to a, a, a broader technique of delineation, then to a geopolitical order, and then to a cosmogram. Yeah? One key element of the stack, as we sort of see it, and this has to go to the same question of the artificial reality, is that and I think well, there's another, a whole other project to be talk, to, to sort of talk about this, and has to do with the history of the interface, like the graphical user interface, within a larger history of the image. One of the unique things about the interface, the like user interface, is it has to be understood both, both in terms of a history of the image, and particularly the mechanical image, that is, a, that it is an image that is produced, but it, it's a unique kind of image, a kind of diagrammatic image, and that is that the activation of the image by pointing and clicking the diagram actually causes effects back upon the system that the diagram is diagramming. Right? So think about you know, like famous diagrams like Menard's diagram of Napoleon's march into Russia or any diagram you wish to imagine. The interface is then that diagram which, if manipulated, alters the thing that it's diagramming. And this is unique within this history of the image. And to think of in terms of the history of technology, the history of control mechanisms onto feedback systems, the graphical user interface is unique because it is, uses these visual, iconographic, diagrammatic metaphors in order to do these things. So in my initial sort of improvisational response to your question is that we could see interfaces in a way as, a, as having a kind of cosmographic capacity to them, in that they diagram the systems that they describe. And yet, in addition to simply being images of the system, a world map, they also become technologies. They become technologies by which the manipulation of the image then works back upon the other, such that the cosmogram could perhaps do all those three of those other things, be an act of territorial claiming be an act of the world ordering and all these sorts of things as well. So that it's this instrumentalization of the cosmogram, if you like. Maybe I'm sort of improvising, but that's the way, that would be my answer, yeah. yeah. Um, Benjamin, Bratton, thanks a lot. Oh, my pleasure. Thank thanks you very much. much. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>